welcome to the show. Wow. How are you? Good. Wow, Zoom. It's my first time with Zoom. Oh, oh look, there's other people here. <laughs> yes, yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hi, you crazy kids. <laughs> I was gonna, so, since I was just figuring this out, I was going to, you know, greet you with my, my mask. <laughs> oh, I have my mask, too. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. yeah. Excellent. So, um, well, Sam, um, I don't know if a whole lot of people know you, so I'm going to give you a quick introduction here. Uh, Sam is a absolutely astounding urban planner and researcher and author. Uh, he is the author of the, I hope, the best-selling book, J-Bangs, which is basically a book on how Universal, specifically Jay Stein, really understood how to beat Disney at building, like, the world's best theme park and understanding, you know, how to actually do things in a more relevant way for today's audience. Um, now, Sam's done a lot of other things, too. He wrote uh, Walt and the Promise of Progress City, which is kind of an Epcot history book, which is how, you know, the original Epcot, the city, was going to be planned. Uh, he's also written uh, multiple other uh, Disney and uh, Disney versus Universal or Universal versus Disney, uh, Disneyland story, I believe. And That's right. You were an urban planner and you, you designed one of the, the master plans. Is that the, the city of, I want to say, was that Pasadena or no, you're from Pasadena? Oh, no, I did. Um, uh, for a while, I was doing general, what are called general plans in California or comprehensive plans, I think, in Florida, um, and, and did about a dozen of those. So uh, city of Claremont, city of West Hollywood, city, uh, county of San Bernardino, Pasadena, a bunch of places. Okay. Rialto, Hilton. And now you travel around the country and you do consulting yeah. and you do lectures, you're on TV every so often, and you are visiting America's greatest treasures are uh, our parks. Uh, is that uh, is that pretty much fair to say? That's right. That's right. And by writing the uh, Universal book, it got me a gig as the as their visiting scholar, <laughs> which I think is just kind of funny. But hey, it got me a trip to Japan. So yeah. okay. well, welcome to our theme park design class. Uh, you have uh, lectured in this again. I think it was what about a year and a half ago, two years ago now. Last yes, time just, you just starting to do this. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, um, today uh, you promised to talk about some universal history, I think, uh, was uh, your plan, or you can talk about what anything, anything you like. Uh, we're just happy to have you. So thank you. All right. Well, I, I can start a little bit, but do you guys have anything in particular, uh, if, if it helps any, what I really have tried to understand is kind of the DNA between Disney's parks and Universal's parks and recognizing that um, their foundation is very different from each other. And because of that, when they're true to themselves, they tend to work. And when they're not true to themselves, they, they don't. So if you guys have any particular questions or interests, um, give me some guidance and stuff like that. Okay. Because I don't want to see anybody sleeping or oh, Sam guys, are, you know, so, <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, uh, I'll start. Let's see here. Let's go to the top corner over here. That would be Nazar. Na I'm sorry, Nazarkin. Yeah, Nazar you can call me Nisa. Me Nisa, know. okay, Nisa. What are you interested in this whole um, theme park design stuff? I think it's interesting, like, to know what is going on and what, like, what do we need to plan ahead, like when we graduate and stuff. Okay. And like in the class, we able to like create like queue line design. I mean, queue design or like product and team practice side too and i think it's interesting to know all okay. that stuff yeah if you want to be geeky academic about this whole mm -hmm. thing you could call it uh closed narrative uh environments um and jack has just run away <laughs> <laughs> jack is pondering that question while he runs to the bathroom uh Brittany, <laughs> i see you are on pause and don't have a face um what, oh, what, sorry. my camera is not working for some reason tonight i'm on a different computer that's okay. We all have bad hair. Um, the, uh, the, <laughs> tell me, except for Bill, does he have like a barber that comes in and does his oh, hair? No, no, That's I, what I, I said. I cut, my own hair. I cut my own hair. So, yeah. It's, uh, it's, right. it's, I'm I glad I, eyes. I can't do the back. If you would see the back, you'd realize my hair looks actually pretty awful. But uh, yeah. it can, the camera only shows certain things. So, our president has the same thing. So, uh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I feel like the the uh, Brady Bunch. Okay, so Brittany, what, what brought you to a design, a, a theme park design class? I like really 
I've grown up in the theme park industry, so learning how like all of the rides are built and what goes into it really like interested me. Okay, so you want to see how the sausage is made. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then you get sick of the sausage. All right, Jack's back. All right, Jack. So what uh, <laughs> what, what got you to a theme park design class? Um, same thing kind of along with what Brittany said. I just was always interested in the how things got done and understanding the whole process. And I've, I've always kind of considered going into working for theme parks and stuff. So this, this uh -huh. was like my first theme park class of learning about all that. Okay, very cool. So so there seems to be a, a theme, which is you're just a fan, but you're a fanboy, but you want to be, everybody's a fanboy, but you want to be more. There's something, there's something that's intellectually sparking something in you that goes, there's something more to than this than just right. standing in front a facade of a building and what is that what's what's behind it so far that's good that's good that's uh, that and it's that's that kind of inquisitiveness is 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 really fundamental to this particular business uh and kate how about you okay well i'm just gonna come right out and be honest that i'm a disney fan i'm <laughs> i'm team <What>? disney <laughs> but hey. i always knew i wanted to do something really creative um I was thinking for a long time of doing like live entertainment inside the parks, like, um, okay. like, you know, their theater shows and doing something with that. Because uh, he does that better than Universal. Yeah. <laughs> but I also just really was so fascinated with how they could take worlds that people would only see in films or, you know, even like cartoon films and yeah. bring them to life so that you really feel like they're in them. And I think that that is just something so special that I would love to learn how to create. So okay. that's why I took this class. <laughs> okay, good, good. And and just to be fair, I mean, I, I've written about Universal. I wrote the Disneyland story, which is the definitive history of Disneyland. Uh, Walt Disney Imagineering has hired me to do consulting work as well as Universal Creative. So I, I, I like both. I just sort of, um, just lately, I, I just sort of think that Universal um, seems to be firing on on more cylinders than disney is uh lately and, and i and i happen to know the guy who's doing their new theme park and he's just brilliant and so i have high hopes for their new theme park so i love universal i mean their their roller coasters are incredible like, yeah, disney yeah. has nothing on their roller coasters <laughs> and you hit on something we'll talk a little bit about the histories of them and that is um let's talk about live shows for instance there is always been a definitive difference between the live shows between universal and disney first of all disney itself has always had a theatrical background they spend a lot of money on their shows they are spending so much money to be almost broadway shows that they then turn them into broadway shows you know they test run mm -hmm. them in the theme parks and stuff like that in universal's case when the when the studio tour started in 1964 in los angeles and hollywood um, there was a guy named harrison buzz price buzz price worked for walt disney and found the location of both disneyland walt disney world uh, tokyo disneyland um, did over 150 uh, financial studies for walt disney as a consultant and he also because walt really liked the guys over at universal he liked uh, lou wasserman he liked uh, jules stein um, the guys who ran universal he's really actually best friends with this guy named uh, jules stein um, uh, he lent Buzz out to him and said, hey, Buzz is your guy. Buzz will help you. And Buzz Price basically wrote what the tour for Dis uh, Universal should be. And when he did the studies for that, he talked about shows. And he said that there is no way that Universal could ever compete with Walt Disney when it comes to live shows. That Walt Disney will always do better and better and invest the money in those shows. So instead of trying to fight it, and to try to compete against Disney, Universal decided what we'll do is we'll involve audience members in all of our shows. So their shows were mostly like, well, how did you make a TV show? And we're gonna have you jump in this thing of water, very, you know, MGM Studios kind of stuff. Um, or like the, uh, uh, what was it? The uh, uh, Indiana Jones show in Florida. If you remember you guys all in Florida where they brought the audience members on that's a mm -hmm. very universal thing. That's not a Disney thing at all. Disney never brought, because Disney wanted to present very professional shows. Universal 
had fun with the idea that people will forgive you for the amount of money you spent on producing the show because their friends are kind of funny being stuffed into those situations. And that was always a consistent with universal shows. We're going to involve audience members. They're going to be part of the theatrical production. We're going to integrate them in the show. We're going to let it fly. Um, and Disney was always, we're going to give you Broadway quality shows. And that was a big difference between the two. Another thing that Universal did that was different than Disney is, well, if we can't compete on, let's call it quality of the show, um, we'll just blow things up in front of people. We'll put half, <laughs> in, we'll have fires. Um, and that's how uh, the Conan show in Hollywood came. It was the first time that somebody combined all these special effects in a theme park show. And in, they, in that case, Universal created the stunt spectacular that you see everywhere. And that was a very universal thing. They did one themed after Miami Vice, for instance. Uh, they still have one after the movie West War uh, Westworld, uh, Waterworld. <laughs> More people have seen the Waterworld live show than have ever seen the movie Waterworld. And a lot of people don't even know there was a movie called Waterworld. They just, they just see these shows. In Japan, it's one of the most uh, uh, biggest shows there. And in Hollywood, hey, David, it's about time you got on here. All right, so um, so in the live entertainment, there is a distinct difference between the two. And if you think about it, Universal has nice parades, but Disney has fabulous parades. Um, Disney has wonderful Broadway-like shows. Universal had Beetlejuice, <laughs> you know? So um, th there, there's a difference that's there. And, and that also kind of goes with the genesis of the two parks. I mean, in Disney's case, Walt Disney, you know, as the story goes, wanted something for families to do. And he wanted to take his daughters who were on the merry-go-round and he wanted to go on the merry-go-round with them and wanted to hang out with them and have those experiences. I mean, a lot of that is part of the myth of Disneyland. But the reality of it is 1948, the Walt Disney Studios was in really, really big financial trouble. And Walt Disney was just trying to figure out something that he could do so that he could keep these artists that he really, really liked somehow or other employed because the movies business was just tanking on him by 1948. And he started thinking of this, well, I really liked amusement parks. I've always been fascinated by amusement parks let me start to think and i even was going to put one next to my studio in burbank but maybe that's what i should do maybe i can get into the amusement park business uh, instead of the movie business and started hunting around the idea for um what, what became disneyland but originally was a bunch of trains driving around the country where you put a nickel in a machine and a little rocking chair would go and granny from one of the movies would start talking to you you know that kind of thing um a lot of people don't know that so Universal, on the other hand, was quite different. Universal was a company called MCA, Music Company of America, which was by the 50s and the 60s, truly the most powerful entertainment company in the entire world. Um, if you were a musician, you probably had MCA as your agent. If you were a television network, you probably had about a third of your programming to almost half of your programming coming from one studio called Review Studios that was owned by MCA. MCA was making all the television shows in the 50s and the 60s. Um, the Adams Family, the Munsters, I mean, all this stuff came out of out of that, that's becoming a party now. Um, hi, David, welcome. Why are you in this class, David? David? <laughs> Come on, David, wake up. <laughs> this is your guest speaker, all right? Blake, how about you? Why are you in this class? Actually, I think they're coming in from the other class. Actually, sir, I'm in from uh, a different class. I just happened to pop in, and uh, I heard about oh. you earlier today my one o'clock I, I teach two different theme park classes and I, I i offered for a couple extra students to come in uh from the earlier class uh oh okay very good all right well then hi everybody sorry about putting you on the spot like that <laughs> <laughs> this is fun i feel like the the muppets uh video when they did bohemian rhapsody <laughs> oh that's a good video yeah. yeah, I don't know. If you guys haven't seen it, really go check that one out. <laughs> so in, in Universal's case, Universal, it was a much different culture. Um, in Universal's case, they were, they were business was booming for them. Uh, MCA bought Universal Studios movie lot just so they could make television shows because they needed the space to do that. Then they ultimately brought a record company called DECA, which owned the Universal movie company. Uh, still continued to churn out the, the TV hits and everything. And, and in, in MCA, 
the culture of the company, which I get into quite a bit in J-Bangs, was watch the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. And it was a very, and, and then the way that everybody worked in the company, because they were mostly talent agents um, and Hollywood people, they were a very different corporate culture. They dressed all in identical black suits, black ties, white shirts. They look kind of like the men in black, as, um, as, they, as they would say, dress British, think Yiddish. Um, and just be really, uh, which is, you know, watch the pennies, the dollars will take care of themselves. So a guy um, that, uh, named Al Durskin, who was the, Al Durskin, who was the uh, financial guy for MCA, looked at every line item on the MCA movie lot, the Universal movie lot. What he noticed, one of the things he noticed was that the, um, is that the commissary was losing money. <laughs> and, and he thought, how could a commissary lose money? I, I got to make money. So he was pondering this while sitting at the farmer's market in Los Angeles. And one day noticed that a bus was pulling up from the Gray Line tour and a bunch of tourists were getting out and then they were going and having lunch. And he got this idea. Ah, ah I'll tell you what, I'll charge the Gray Line people a buck ahead. They could drive their bus over onto our back lot. We'll just guide them to we'll drive them around the back lot for a few minutes. Then we'll drop them off in front of the commissary and they could have lunch in a true Hollywood studio commissary. Raise the price 25 cents or 25% at the commissary and then started making money hand over fist in the, in the commissary. And that's the reason why the Universal Studios tour started because he had these gray line tour buses and then Al figuring out the money and realized, hey, we're making a lot of money here. So he hired Buzz Price. Buzz Price did this study and said, well, you know, if you did a tram and you did this and you did that and all this kind of stuff, you could have a pretty profitable tour. And I, and I think I could predict that you'll, you'll have like three years into it, you'll have almost a million people a year coming to it. It'd be very complimentary to Disneyland because the world was coming to Disneyland but the people wanted to go to Hollywood. And at the time, Hollywood was not a very friendly place. So it was a chance for people to experience Hollywood on a real back lot in a real movie studio. And they made a bunch of money. So in 64, they did this as a test run. They came up with the idea of the trams. The idea of the tram was quite simply because where they wanted to have people load on the tour was up on the hill and the back lots on the bottom of the valley and they just needed to get people up and down. So they did a test run. They bought these little van, these trams. The tram was taking a bunch of secretaries up the hill from MCA. And this was 1964. And as you can imagine, secretaries in the Hollywood area were wearing the really spiky heels and the really pointy shoes. And then the tram broke and they had to walk back to their studio. So they immediately changed the engines out to much bigger trams. They didn't really announce the tour was going to open in 64. They did it really as a test run, but the test was very successful. By the next year, um, the, they continued on and, and the guy who was running the thing, uh, Barry Upson, was really quite pleased. Lou Wasserman, however, the guy who was running MCA at the time thought, hmm, if this is doing this well, this could actually do a lot better. Let's invest some money in it and let's get the right guy who knew how to kick some ass. And that's when they hired Jay Stein, who was working already in the back lot because there was starting to be a common conflict. You see, the people who were making television and movies really just did not like buses driving through the back lot the entire time. And they were getting very frustrated and they were doing everything they could to thwart the tour by, you know, having the buses go around things, way around things, not see anything. Um, and then when the tram started, it was the same sort of thing. So they needed to get somebody who was friendly to the production people and also could get the tour happening. And Jay Stein was a 26 year old guy who was kind of on the make there. He started in the mail room. And at 26 years old, he was offered the job of being a vice president of MCA, Music Corporation of America, the most powerful entertainment company in the entire universe at the age of 26 to run their theme park. He had to say yes. <laughs> His dad suggested it was a good idea. So, And then from there, Jay just kind of went on and created what, we, what became the Universal Studios Tour. Oh, good, my theater is working. <laughs> Yay! Um, I'm, for those who just joined us and everything, I, I live full-time in an Airstream interstate. It's a Mercedes van. And I'm right now in Natural Falls State Park in Oklahoma because it's one of the very few states that actually has state parks open because of the coronavirus. And, uh, and I've been having heater issues and the fact that it just turned on is, is very exciting. <laughs> uh, it's good because it's going to be 
freaking cold out here. All right, so <laughs> I will uh, stop for a moment. Questions so far about anything? You should uh, have lots of questions because you all had to read Buzz Price's book. So. Oh, yeah. And, and I, and Buzz Woods, an absolutely amazing man. I mean, generous in time. And really, Ep the, 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 the first Epcot book is because of Buzz. Uh, he, he got me the inside information because he was one of about five people working on the project. He got me a lot of information that allowed me to come up with what is apparently the uh, most realistic description of what Walt Disney had in, in his mind for Epcot. So I thought I saw a question from Blake. Um, I did, but actually... Uh... Kate looks like she had a question, so I was gonna. Okay, eight. <laughs> oh, um, I was just wondering, like, how he got that job at twenty six. Like, what was? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's amazing. He was um he was in the um he was in the National Guard. Got out of the National Guard. He got hired to be in the mail room because he happened to know a guy that was there. So he got a job in the mail room and, and that was a great job because you're in the mail room, you get to see everybody, you get to meet everybody. You got to see who's who, who's interacting. You got to meet the, the secretaries. It got your ear to the ground. So he was in the mail room and then he got one job on a production side where he could ultimately line himself up to become a director. But Jay was a very aggressive guy and he met the, he met the MCA mold which was you work your ass off constantly. You take no grief. You just, it's, it was a very, very, very intense um, environment to work at MCA and work at MCA. So he, he started in this sort of one part of the production, then got into the side where he was responsible for taking the scripts that were given and then working with the art directors, figuring out which studio or backlot space they should be assigned for that part of the production. And this is at a time when they were making 18 hours a week for only three networks of television. So he, he knew everybody who was producing stuff. He knew everybody who was doing the art direction. He knew everything there was about how you make films. And he was well on his way of becoming, probably becoming a, um, uh, as he thought, was going to become a producer. And he was well on the way. And he was going to turn down the tour job originally because he thought, well, I'm going to be a producer until his dad suggested, if Lou Wasserman is asking you to do a job like this, you just say yes, because he's not going to ask you a second time. And your career will just end because nobody, you'll have no faith. Somehow, just like Walt Disney, he knew you were the right guy. And, and Jay ultimately was. He was. He became a guy who, in meetings, could be so brutal that they would make people cry in the meetings. And this was actually considered a good thing. People who worked for Jay were always under threat by Jay. And at the end would basically say, oh, I'll show that guy. And they end up doing their best work and years later realized that, that this monster of a man was the reason why they did their their absolute best work, and so um, uh, it was it was interesting to meet him because everybody was very scared of Jay's time, <laughs> and I've just heard lots of stories about by why. But but I think that um, to the, the short answer to your question is, he was just a guy at the right place at the right time who fed a fed a part was part of a corporate culture and understood that corporate culture and worked well within that corporate culture and was able to rise be and was able to rise because of that um and and then proved out to be really good i mean at the end of the day if you think about it not only did he turn the hollywood studio tour into a major tourist attraction he is the only reason why universal florida is that was created and then this is something a lot of people don't know you know Universal Studios ran far more hotel rooms than Disney did for many, many years because Universal Studios ran every campground and hotel room and every facility inside of Yosemite National Park. Uh, and 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 they they were they, they they basically were the hospitality company for Yosemite National Park for almost 20 years. The tram tour that took people around in Washington D.C. and then took them up to um, to Arlington that was a Universal Studios production as well. So uh, they were doing they were doing more tourist and more hotel rooms than Disney was while Disney was creating Walt Disney World until Michael Eisner came along. So 
Yeah, right time at the right place. That's, I think, pretty much the, uh, you almost ask almost anybody, I think, in this business. Uh, ultimately, I think that's the answer. How did you get that gig? Um, it's either I really knew somebody or I was in the right place at the right time. And a lot of those are the same. Other questions, this is good. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So. Blake. Yes, sir. So I have a couple questions for you, but um, I'm just one of those kind of the guys. But when it comes to the tram tour, what took it from, uh, you know, Sam just saying, hey, you know, let's can you allow us to, let, you know, do these tours to, hey, we can make an entire theme park after this. Was there like a conversation or does it happen <laughs> to be some investors saying, you know what? Or Oh, yeah. No, no. It's, it's like everything. It's just, um, well, we have to do this now. Um, and, and in this case, when the tour first started in 64, 65, 66, right around that time, um, the, uh, the tour guides were like ultra stars. In fact, many of them became stars or directors. Um, they, it was, it was a great way of getting in Hollywood because, you know, you had a lot of famous people that go on the tour. Uh, you'd get to meet a lot of people because you were backstage and it, the way the tour was described to me in the original scripts. And I have the original scripts for the tour is, is imagine if you could hop the fence of the busiest back lot in the entire world and go anywhere that you want and see anything that you could see. That's what the Universal Tour was. So in the morning in 65, for instance, the tour guys would see what the production schedule is, figure out which sound stages are being used, and then just take guests on those sound stages so they can watch the shows as they were being filmed. Or would take the trams back, and there were certain friendly productions like McHale's Navy. Those guys, whenever the tram would come by, they would stop and they all would come, oh, we'll sign autographs for you. The Munsters were apparently like that. There's a few other shows where the people were, the, the actors were really quite good. There was a couple of shows, though, that the actors really hated them, and they would hide <laughs> and do stuff that was like that. So um, that was what the original premise of the tour was. And it was very successful and it was very free form. Because the tour was so successful in 1968, the Screen Actors Guild got a thing in their new contract that said you can't have tour groups on a soundstage while they're trying to produce a show. <laughs> so one of the things that Jay Stein realized is he needed to come up with a consistent show so that when the audience came and spent all that money on their ticket, that it would be a consistent show. It was a consistency issue, you know. It was pretty happenstance. Some days you would go in and the tour would last four hours. Some day it would be like an hour, depending on what was going on. They wanted consistency. So the Screen Actors Guild said you can't bring people onto the back lot. So Jay started realizing he needed to create situations that were constantly there that they could take advantage of. So one of them was to take what was part of a set um, for a wagon train, and that became the famous flood that's still there. And the tram goes in, and then it gets goes about to get flooded. The second one, the second one was really stupid. The second one was a uh, this the the tram would pull up, and the driver would hit like a little button from a garage door opener, and on a cable this gorilla would slide down along the side of the tram and then go behind the bush and then he'd press it again and it would get towed back. It was that really, that was it. It was that stupid. <laughs> and, and a lot of the back lot guys would dress it and put bras and panties or, you know, put a suit on it, and, you know, and the guy would go, Hey, and then all of a sudden, Oh, okay. Oh, let's go. <laughs> and then they did ones like uh, one of the first real professional ones was they had these styrofoam balls that look like rocks and they would roll down the side of a hill and they would bounce up and then over the tram unless it was wet. And then they would capture water and then they would get kind of waterlogged and they would go lapping into the tram and people were getting hit by styrofoam rock water balls. Um, uh, that was a pretty amazing attraction that was there for a while as well. That was the first time they used actually non-studio people to build the the little attraction so it, it became this sort of thing where the guys would sit around and they would get really drunk and they're going hey what the hell could we do with this tram oh we could go and oh let's stick it on a bridge and make it shake oh let's <laughs> send it off into space and they made this big list of things that they could do to the tram. And of course, by meaning that with the people in the tram, um, and then that became the template. So it'd be like, you know, December, January, Jay would look at the different things. Now, of course he knew every producer that was in the world out there. So he knew what intellectual properties might be available. And that didn't hurt any either. 
And then what Jay would do is he would uh, tell his design design team, which was about three guys, it was really small, like Barry Upson and Peter Alexander and a couple of other guys. Um, and they would, he would say, I want you to, uh, I have this vision of a television commercial. It was always the TV commercial first. I have this vision of a television commercial. We have the tram and we just shake it, make it look like it's going to fall off a bridge. Can you do it? Of course you can do it. Great. I need it in four months. And that the whole thing would be done in four months. They would just come up with it. They would engineer it. They would install it. They would test it. And by that spring, that was what the big TV advertising was going to be. You're in the Los Angeles area. You're going to go to Disneyland anyways. You're sitting in your hotel room. There's going to be a television commercial. It'll be Alfred Hitchcock and go, come with me. We're going to go and you're going to go up into space and Battlestar Galactica. Or you can meet the Incredible Hulk or that sort of thing. And and that's that's how they did it. And, and the television commercials were generally far far superior to what the attractions were but they didn't mind because it was hollywood right it was you know it's what all it's about it's a little, little flash a little show it's not like disneyland where they had to really impress you and make you go oh i'm off into a whole other world at that time it, it was it was hollywood you know when we're done with it we'll just peel the tinsel off and you can look at the tinsel that's right behind it and everyone kind of loves that stuff, like being able to see, it's kind of seeing the magician's act and then being able to see how the magician actually did it. So like everyone's really. And, and that was, that was the premise. In fact, that's one of the reasons Walt Disney was one of the biggest fans of the Universal Studio Tour is because when he designed Disneyland, it's really kind of what he wanted to do is he wanted to take people and immerse them within the films. But because he was doing animation, it just didn't really work for him as well. And it took somebody like Jay to figure out how do you take the filmmaking process and slice it up into ways where you could take the average guest and impress upon them, but make them want to see more and not necessarily show them that. <laughs> you know, that's important um, to keep them coming back for a little bit more. I'm going to show you the secret, but then you're still gonna be, uh. and then I guess that'll bring you to the, hold up the J Bangs book again. Mr. Talk Show host, there we go. The title J Bangs is the, D the definition of the DNA of the Universal theme parks. Um, J Bangs was a term that came up by a guy named Phil Hedema, who was a designer at uh, was a designer and did um, uh, well. Actually, he was the he was the prime designer of of, of of what am I thinking of? Bill, the other park, Universal Islands of Adventure. I yeah. guess Phil's really, he was like the head design guy for Universal Islands of Adventure. It'd probably be the easiest way for you all to know who he was. Um, and he came up with this phrase, J-Bangs, and it wasn't really meant as a compliment. What it was, was that the Disney wants to always embrace you. It wants to immerse you within a story or within a setting and comfortly guide you through, occasionally maybe shake you a little bit, but you're going to get wonderful embrace. Universal was to scare the shit out of you. It was designed to get you by the collar and go, watch this. And I'm not going to have fake fire. I'm going to have real fire. I'm not going to have smoke. I'm going to have smoke in your face. You're going to be immersed in smoke. And every Universal attractions had to have what became known as J-Bank. So you'd write your script for your show. You'd write your script for, let's say, the bridge falling. And then you had to write on the cover of the J-Bangs, the three to four highlights climatic moments within the show that have to get bigger and bigger and bigger on a scale of one to ten so that by the time you get to the last j bang the last whoosh, everybody's like, ah, that's like, ah, that's like i mean um how how many of you remember terminator 2 3d at universal some of you one of you okay okay a couple of you um that show had been around forever and at the end of it the entire audience sank like two inches and completely immersed in fog and that show had gone on forever and at the end of it and tell me if i'm wrong you guys everybody applauded they just went crazy they just love it because it, it was a j-bang it was like if you think of almost every universal attraction you've ever been on um uh nisa what's your favorite one what's your favorite universal attraction i'm assuming you'd like universal she's got me on mute okay fine uh, Kate, what's your favorite Universal attraction? Um, I really love The Mummy and I love The Hulk. Okay, all right, all right. So think about it. In The Mummy, what's the point where where something happens to you that you go, ah, and you look at your friend and you both share that moment? There are so many points in that ride. I feel like when they have like 
the bug they have like bugs or something on the screen and then you go backwards and then the roller coaster starts and there's fire and it's like so if you really break that ride down and you really figured out what were those climatic moments you would find there's probably about six j bangs and that they would go from a scale to zero to 10, that they have to, like in any good action movie, they have to just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Jack, what's your favorite uh, Universal attraction and what's the moment that you get that feeling? I haven't been to Universal in quite a while, but I, I like the the Men in Black ride. Okay, all right, all right. Um, I don't, so the I don't J- know. The J-Bangs there are like, for instance, when you shoot the other party and everybody yeah, starts spinning. And then you get to the very end and everybody has to shoot the big monster. So you have to share that moment. And then the climatic moment in this particular case is humor. You've got the scoring at the end, which is, you know, pretty clever, actually. You know, sometimes you don't want to try very hard just so you can be made fun of. All right, Blake, what about you? Oh, I'm a huge uh, Jurassic Park. So yeah. that that a nice hundred foot drop at the end really, uh, yeah. really and gets it builds up. Because you've got the one dinosaur that comes out of the water, and then you get the what? The I don't know. They don't do the car one in Florida, right? They don't have the car, the jeep. Um, really well, they they actually used to. Um, I yeah. haven't been back in a while, but yeah, when you kind of go over before you start going Florida up. Had, Florida's never had the car. We had a crate. We had oh, crate was it? Oh, okay. And it drops on you. So, so think about that for a moment, and let's see others. Uh, Brittany, do you have one? Um. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I have to say, I have never been to Universal. Okay. I grew up in a Disney family, so. Oh. You should go just because they're, you know, it's, it's different. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll be able to go one of these days. Um, yeah. um, but you, you're, you're, you're going to see it because I'm going to ask everyone the same, another question, and you can all answer in on that one. And okay. then, Ryan, um, do you have a particular Universal ride that you really like that has that moment? Probably Spider Man. Oh yeah, okay. It's the best ride in the world. Um, yeah, and there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of moments in Spider-Man that that have that right. You know, when the uh, um, the fire, just when the pumpkin goes, and you're like blasted with real fire. You know, it's not like fake little screen fire. You can feel the heat, that sort of thing. And uh, Nisa, again, do you did you have one? Oh, she's muted. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Muted. So I only been to Universal once, and I think the most right that i like is um simpson <laughs> okay. okay it's so it's oh, very that's... cute yeah all right yes yeah <laughs> and it's also it's also <laughs> the best parody of any theme parks ever yeah. so think about this for a moment every universal ride you can start to <laughs> you can start to figure out these j banks now think about disney rides and in virtually every disney ride unless it's trying to be a copy of a universal ride they don't have that sort of thing you don't have big climatic moments. Now, uh, I'm a Disneyland guy, so I would say, and it's always been my argument, that the Indiana Jones ride was always designed to be a universal ride. It works like a universal ride. It has J-Banks throughout it. And it was built at a time when it was Disney's Imagineering was trying to show that you may have come up with Islands of Adventure, but um, um, but we, we can do the same sort of thing. Um, but But if you think about every other Disney ride, they don't really have those moments. I mean, the Expedition Everest sort of does, but it's ultimately a roller coaster. And I would judge, I would guess most of you would agree that the roller coasters at Universal are better than the ones at Disney, even though Disney invented the steel roller coaster for the Matterhorn. Um, But if you look at Disney rides, they talk about it. It's a lot of it. It's all about the story. We want to tell you a story. Uh, I would argue that's not really what Disney is trying to do. Disney's trying to give you the architecture of reassurance. It's trying to eliminate the visual contradictions so that your lizard brain will relax and you can start to communicate with the world in a much different way and that you can absorb the story and become one within the environment. That's what Disney is all about. It's all about the forest, whereas Universal is all about the trees. Universal is about the Hulk. It's about Spider-Man. It's about the Simpsons. It's about Dr. Seuss. It's about the intellectual properties. And when Disney does the stuff all about the intellectual properties, it tends not to do it as well as Universal. It tends to do genres better. It tends to give you these overall environments in which you can become part of that story. And you also will find that that's not necessarily the case at most of the Universal parks. So um, so those are some of the distinct differences. They, they really are J-bangs, the idea I'm going to shake you up. 
um, is a universal thing. And this warm embrace, this architecture of reassurance is definitely the, uh, is definitely the Disney case. All right, somebody ask a question while I sip my Diet Coke. Anybody? I was actually kind of sad when a Universal took away that disaster ride because it was actually like you're on a tram and they really had that J bangs like you're going there you're kind of on a movie set but yet mm -hmm. you're still in that action that still threw a lot at you and had a nice little finale so it's kind of like being on a movie set ride. Yeah, like, yeah, the rock is still in the same ride that's there. I will say that the, the Musion technology that they used at the beginning with the Christopher Walken character, when it was interacting with the audience member or with the, the cast member was really absolutely genius. And there was so many good subtle things, but yeah. And that was, that was because that was a case of where that element, that show element was part of the tram ride in California. And when they decided to do the universal park in Orlando, they realized they realize they don't have to um, have a tram because there's not a hill, everything's flat. So they had a tram for what, Bill, like six months or something at the beginning of it. Yeah, yeah, the park actually, that's that's the fun part of Universal's history out here. They, uh, If you know your uh, understanding of a movie studio, you have a front lot and a back lot. And in California, both of those areas are off limits. And the front lot refers to the areas that are um, basically sound stages where you're filming indoors because you don't want any of the audio. Uh, your back lot is where you build the freestanding sets, uh, facades or false fronts, and you actually have lagoons, everything else on the back lot. Well, at Universal out here, uh, they came up with the idea that the back lot should actually be the area where you walk around in the park. And then the tram can just go around there in the same area that people are walking around. That didn't work out too well. And the tram was shortened to just do the front lot but then, you know, who wants to just see a bunch of sound stages, you know, on a tram and then it eventually closed. So that's the history of the tram tour at Universal Studios Florida in less than a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and what's really quite remarkable about Universal Studios Orlando and then, of course, the Disney MGM Studios, uh, which was what it was called back then with Disney Hollywood Studios now, is that, um, and this is through my research that I've seen, is that what Disney ended up opening was pretty much a stolen <laughs> from what Universal was planning on opening. And when Universal saw that, they went, oh, we got to come up with something really different. I, I will say that within, um, it's it's my guess that within the next five years or so, if you were to go to Hollywood, you're going to be able to walk around the back lot as well. They're, they're going to they're gonna find a way of connecting the two because they're not doing a lot of production in the back lot. It's cheaper actually to go out in the streets of Los Angeles and film than it is to film in a back lot. So um, uh, they have to find something to do with it. And, and, it's, and to me personally, the back lot areas of the Universal Studios were designed by Hollywood's very best back lot designers. Um, uh, and, and I think they're the best parts of the theme park. The, they've still remained timeless. Uh, you can still go wandering in those little back alleys. And the level of detail is, is um, equal or superior to anything that Disney has ever done. Um, and, and that's because the guys were influenced by, weirdly enough, Knott's Berry Farm. <laughs> they looked at the windows of Knott's Berry Farm's um, uh, ghost town and went, let's do something like that, where there's something actually happening in each of these windows. So um, let's take a moment. Uh, other questions between Disney versus Universal? I do have a question. Yes. So why do you say it's cheaper to like film out in like the streets of California than to do it in a back lot? Oh, because it's it's factually the case. The uh, the tax benefits, <laughs> the tax benefits um, <laughs> of filming for most localities um, uh, works to the advantage of a production house. So you'll see uh, usually the only people using back lots are usually TV commercials. Um, but virtually every car commercial um, is filmed in downtown Los Angeles. Most shows are filmed um, actually in the streets. Uh, a lot of states, I mean, Breaking Bad was in New Mexico simply because New Mexico gave them a tax break. Um, so it's, it's for if you're a Hollywood producer, you'll find that a lot of municipalities would rather have you come out and film in their cities. Uh, and so the backlots just they just aren't used as they just aren't used as much anymore. Cool, thank and, you for that. Question. And there's not very many of them either. There's like Hollywood Universal Studios is the biggest back lot and Disney created kind of a, a smaller back lot way out in the boonies uh, to make up for um, um, some a couple of television shows, so. This is the other book that Sam was talking about, Universal versus Disney, so. 
you ever find that it. Was my, that was my, I was supposed to write a book about Walt Disney World, but I just thought Walt Disney World was kind of boring and didn't want to write a history book about it. <laughs> Other questions, please. <laughs> No, don't get me wrong on this. This uh, the the hold on, thing. hold on. Kate has her puppy. Hold on. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I said the Disney, the Walt well, Disney World is boring. I saw a lot of your faces going. <laughs> what I mean by that, <laughs> the genesis of Disneyland um, fascinated me. Walt Disney World was the part of Walt Disney World I really was interested in was Epcot, was the city that Walt was trying to create, um, not the theme park. The theme park itself is a is a is a great documentation of what happens when computers start to become part of the design process. Um, they, they calculated how many people they wanted to have in the park and the sidewalks were designed to accommodate that number of people. Um, and there's a lot of that. And that's one of the reasons why Walt Disney World feels very big and impressive, um, uh, whereas Disneyland feels very warm and huggable. And so I'm, you know, that's just the West Coast bias. Sorry, grew up in the West Coast. Other questions, now that I've offended about half of you, at least. <laughs> uh, oh, did you have a oh, question? Go ahead, Blake. Yeah. Kate? No. Oh. So my, my question for you is, now that Universal and Disney are always going kind of tit for tat in terms of bringing up new lands and attractions, um, you know, and of course, Universal really, you know, threw it in Disney's face, getting Harry Potter. With this new Epic Universe kind of coming out, do you see Universal kind of taking uh, the front again, you know, as opposed to Disney kind of being the big behemoth for the past couple um, years now that their Star Wars land isn't as uh, productive as they would have hoped? Or is that too much of a... No, I, I think that, no, I, I, um, um, I think that both companies are doing, do extraordinary work. Now, I've not seen the Star Wars both in California or in Florida yet. So I, I have to do that. So I can't really comment on, on that. And I certainly can't comment on Epic Universe either. Um, um, although I will say that the guy who's designing it is brilliant. So <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got a good team. I was to say, I think they got a good shot. Um, oh, nice photo, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. Very good. Um, the, 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 the the sort of the subtitle of Jay Bangs was uh, uh, Universal beating Disney at its own game is that I think that when it came to exploiting specific intellectual properties, Universal has a tendency to do that better than Disney tends to do that because that's their that's really their DNA when it comes to making lands and stuff like that. Um, um, I, I, I think that what you're starting to see is that Disney, I'm gonna say this, Disney has decided that the audience that it really wants to attract in their future, now this is up until this whole coronavirus thing. So this is, you know, everything's changed. So I'm, I'm talking about, you know, turn the time clock back five months and these guys were all competing against the way that they were all competing with each other. So what's coming up is going to be a whole other new thing. Um, Disney was deciding that we're going to do two things. We're going to, A, only go for an affluent audience. Lower middle class, middle class, we don't need them to visit our parks. We don't need their money. They can go someplace else. They can go to Six Flags. They can go to Universal. They can go someplace else. We want the cream of the crop. We want the top economic division. And what we're going to do is we're going to treat them like they're on the cruise ships except for the cruise ships are on land. So we're going to pre-program their visits down to the minute. So just like you're on a cruise ship, you're within a contained physical space that you have a program already set out for you that you believe was designed specifically for you and your wants and your needs. But the underlying technology of it was to allow Disney to spread out the demand capacity over day parts so that it's convenient for them so they don't have to keep raising demand. We can get more people going on big rides earlier in the morning because we, hey, look, you got the surprise fast pass, that sort of thing. So the idea is to do the cruise ship type experience, but doing it on land to a much more affluent audience that's worth reasonably wanting to pay a premium. 
So that's where I think Disney was going with their company. Um, Universal, once they got by by Comcast and the, the crew who's running the theme parks at Universal. Hi. Um, uh, <laughs> oh. Hi, pal. Did someone <laughs> say capacity? <laughs> okay. Where's my man? Um, <laughs> so uh, I think we're getting to the end of this one, Bill. Universal has decided that what they're going to do is be very old fashioned, be very, very Disneyland. They learned that with Harry Potter, because when they got the Harry Potter thing, they, they were just like, you know, there was GE on them and GE didn't really care. And they gave Warner and JK Rowling just the most enjoyable contract ever. And part of that was, is that the movie studio guys had to design the theme park. So what they did is they went back, you know, turned it all the way back to Disneyland where it was art directors from movie, movie studios designing theme park lands that made Disneyland special as opposed to urban planners designing these theme park areas. And they used movie people to do Harry Potter and it reinvented by taking us back where you're all of a sudden you're in a movie set. So all of a sudden the stores are way too small for the demand. So you have to line up in front of the store. Now, I guess in most stores that would be a real problem. But if you're in a theme park, that means anybody who got, walks in that store is going to buy something and your per capita is going to go way, way, way up and and universal learned the lesson of it, the old walt disney lesson which is its capacity that you want to keep filling the glass and when you've got a full show we're just going to add another ride did you notice that they added the terminator not terminator um the transformers pretty quick while they were doing harry potter just to add another 1800 people an hour that they could shove into the park and give them something to do so universal is all about capacity it's very old-fashioned disney it's run just like an old-fashioned disney park it's designed so that you're never waiting in a line and universal orlando under jay stein was designed the way you never have to wait in long lines to get on the rides because we have such high capacity rides and we have so many of them and with comcast that's kind of where they're going and they also realize that there's a bigger market in the middle class. And so they're providing more affordable housing opportunities, you know, the hotels. They also have, um, if you think of Walt Disney World as the suburbs, Universal Studios is the urban world. It's a city. You, it's more compact. Um, there's the waterways, the bus system. You're not on a bus forever. And that was by design. That's Barry Upson's influence of creating a very compact resort, which over the long run is saving Universal a ton of money because, you know, the size of Walt Disney World, you don't see a lot of the money that they spend, which is the fact that things flooding. Um, they did some bad decisions a few years back, and they've had to spend hundreds of million dollars just to fix flooding on the property. Universal doesn't have any of those problems. They built on what was going to be a shopping mall. So, um, and right against the city and using their sewer system. So it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I, I, I Once again, I, I don't know what the theme park industry looks like in another few years, maybe in a few years. I don't certainly don't know what it looks like within the next year. So I got another question for you that was submitted to me. Uh, okay. As an urban designer, what do you think of the overall design of Universal Orlando as the entertainment complex it is now? And how do you think Universal should tackle the transportation challenges that are coming up when Epic Universe opens? Oh, good question. Well, first of all, I think that the, the idea of, um, this is a very buzz price kind of thing too. He, in fact, he influenced um, the, the city walk, the idea that everybody parks in the same place has to pass through the retail area on their way to their adventures and then has to pass on their way out through the same spaces was absolutely brilliant. And then the, the way that it's designed, which is just basically a, a self-contained loop, um, uh, is, is logical. People don't get lost. It's, it's easy to figure out where everything is at. Um, uh, I think what they're going to end up having to do, and they'll have the resources to do it, is they'll have to come up with some sort of creative fixed rail or fixed transit system that connects all their properties. They, they do have it with the boats right now. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll inevitably have to step away from all the buses and stuff like that. Um, it's just easier to contain the cost that way, especially in a really compact area. Yeah, right now they, um, in the uh, the planning documents I was reading, they do have dedicated bus lanes that are going to go over I-4. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a kind of a weird layout. It goes off of Kirkman and kind of goes over the bridge and then comes back in. Um, but yeah, I, I think eventually that'll probably get turned into a, a fixed rail eventually as well. 
and, and they'll follow the example of a lot of municipalities that call it bus rapid transit, which is that it's a, it's a fixed bus and a fixed busway that can be at some point easily converted to a light rail or whatever kind of technology uh, that they see fit. And, and I'm, I'm sure that the bridge has been um, that they're going over has been pre-designed for that sort of thing. So, you know, we'll, we'll see. It's, it's interesting. They're not going to become Walt Disney World. They're not going to be nearly as spread out. we will always be really compact. That's one of the uh, one of the things I'll kind of miss the idea you can walk to everything, but um, you can't do that really now anyway. So yeah. one thing I do love about Universal is that their parking structure is at least the lower level is tall enough that my van fits underneath it. Can't do that at Disney. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, only I, only I have to worry about that kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. Another uh, question. One, one other question that popped up was uh, how do you, uh, that person just retracted their question, but uh, I think the question was, you know, the open, the open areas of Disney versus the more compact areas of Universal. Is that something that is, you know, intrinsic? I, I think they're talking about Walt Disney World versus Universal Orlando. Is that something that's intrinsic to Universal, or uh, is that going to become a problem when uh, the parks reopen with uh, COVID-19 and in a world after that? Uh, you know, how do you deal with that? Will the parks have to become more open and with open spaces? Oh, wow. Well, I, I mean, one of the nice things about Islands of Adventure is that it's that you can always escape below the main walkway and go to the lagoons area, you know, on the lagoon. That's one of the things I love about that park is that it was designed so that if you really wanted to get away from out the huge flow, you could always walk down uh, below the main, you, you know what I'm all talking about, right? Um, um, I, I, you know, honestly, Bill, I have not thought about what does a public space look like in this current health crisis. It's not, it's uh, right now I'm just trying to figure out where to camp. <laughs> so I haven't, I haven't really applied. Um, you know, it's going to be it, it, at some point we're, we're all going to be wearing little badges that said I've been tested and I have antibodies or, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know what that's going to be. Somehow or other, we're going to have to screen people or, you know, as you walk through the gate, you're going to have somebody stick a temperature thing in your ear um, to allow you into the park. I, I, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. I, I, if we want to talk about a post-vaccine world, I could probably get into that. But for right now, the, the concept of a theme park when people are trying to do physical distancing is contrary. It's designed to be, I mean, at its absolute fundamental bottom line is that a theme park is a, phys a limited physical space with an infinite capacity because either you got people on the sidewalk or you got them in a restaurant or you got them in a line or you got them in a ride. And the more you have of all those other things, the more people you can shove behind the gates. So, that's if that's the fundamental of what a theme park is that's completely opposite of what the world um really wants right now right now you should come out with me up into the forest and enjoy hiking and in the big white outdoors here it's just it's you know <laughs> I, I wish i could i wish i could i'm stuck in san francisco as you can see i yeah i can see that <laughs> maybe universal could do like a hunger game style we can go into the forest and they can have you know, fun attractions for social distancing. <laughs> it's time to bring that Mist Island back, right, Bill? That was going to be. Oh a, the... man, yeah. I haven't talked about Mist Island, and oh, probably oops. I don't. I don't remember. They did. It, does anyone remember the computer game Mist, or when it was re-released? They did a remastered version, that which would probably be the what would be your age. Um, oh, but it, it's considered the the most successful strategy game ever published, ever developed. Um, something ridiculous, like they sold a hundred million copies of it, or whatever. Uh, which is an insane amount to sell for anything. Um, but... I, I do, I do think that one of the things I'm seeing, especially going through all these national parks, you know, right now, especially at national parks, I'm on this mission to visit all the national park service sites in the United States. There's 419 of them as of today. I'm up to 226. I won't hit all 419 because I'm not going to Alaska or Guam or Puerto Rico, um, just too far away. The van can't drive to Guam, um, and um, and and so I've gone. And a lot of those places, the visitor centers are closed, the bathrooms and stuff are closed, but you can still walk around, especially when you're going to battlefields and you know where all the stuff like that is. And there's virtually nobody at these places. Uh, this morning, I was at um, uh, Fort Smith in Arkansas, walking around by myself in, in what was a fort from the uh, 1817 and stuff like that. And, and I think that there's there's a lesson to be learned about creating wonderfully magical 
authentic feeling spaces that people can then go restfully walk around and play their own stories. You know, there, there's something, I mean, it's, it's kind of like um, the best part of Walt Disney World right now is probably Tom Sawyer Island. If you think about it, because you can go just wander around and enjoy the views and relax and sit amongst the trees and not necessarily be right next to people, but people watch from people across the rivers and stuff like that. So, I mean, I mean, those are the kind of spaces that I think people are going to really find appealing. It's also a lot of the spaces that a lot of theme parks have been eliminating over the last few years. It was a, a thing that Walt Disney created. Um, they called it Interstells, which is like in a movie where there's a little quiet moment between action. He made sure that his theme parks always had little spaces like that. Like uh, the, my favorite one at uh, Walt Disney World is in the Magic Kingdom. And there are the rocking chairs that are just outside the exit door of the Hall of Presidents where you can go there and you're sitting and you're elevated. But you can watch the crowd go by like a parade. Wonderful space. So th those kinds of spaces, I think th there's going to be a demand for those kind of spaces. He's bringing in the band now. Uh, any other questions or comments or answers? Have I been entertaining? Point out those spaces are in a pattern language. Another good book. That's that's the book that kind of changed my life and got me into urban planning. And it was uh, written in 1977. And there was a guy named Christopher Alexander, who is is my mentor in planning. And what he did is he recognized that we've been living as a civilizations for thousands of years and we keep doing the same patterns we keep repeating the same things that seem to work and if you can combine those patterns in a creative sort of way you can create spaces and places that feel instantly comfortable and that's what walt disney did if you really break down the disney theme parks there's nothing completely original there it was just walt and his memory and his ability to synthesize all of the favorite places that he visited and put them in one particular place to create um, a physical space that has the magic that it has uh and 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 once again when they do it right they really do it right there and and, and a lot of a pattern language um um those who are in who know joe Rody, you know joe Rody, joe Rody, you know joe Rody from disney <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, man, yeah. the man who now has to stand this way because the ear that had all the earrings is now dipped down there um um i i was on a panel with joe Rody, and that's what i learned that he's like the ultimate christopher alexander fan and and i see that actually i see that at animal kingdom um there's a lot of there's a lot of pattern language in animal kingdom um because of, of this influence and it's a great way of learning how to look at the built environment and then breaking it down into separate little bits and understanding why things work and why things don't work. So it's a very good book. It's, I, my, my thing was, my first book was originally going to be about Christopher Alexander and a pattern language until I realized Walt Disney was practicing exactly the same thing, using empirical data to create places and spaces that will charm people. Yes. Other questions, comments, answers? Um. He's good. No, so you go ahead. Sorry, I have a question. Um, so I feel like in Disney, a lot of the guests that go to Disney are going there for like the IP. And then if you look at an amusement park like um, uh, Bush Gardens, a lot of people go there for like the thrill rides. Yes. Um, so since Universal has like a good combination of thrill rides and IP, what do you think attracts like your guests more like do more people go there for like harry potter and marvel or do you think more people go there for the roller coasters and the i think the case of disney i think that the reason that people go to disney parks my thesis is is they go there for the reassurance that no matter what's going on in their world or in their life that everything's working at disney everybody's friendly everybody's nice everything is clean there's never any trash all the light bulbs are working there's no light bulbs that are burnt out that's why disney fans when they see a little thing that's kind of wrong or a little bit of a mess they just go bonkers and they would never do that anywhere else but i mean the disneyland folks if they see a light bulb burnt out on main street they will write city hall and tell them this light bulb is burnt out you know there there there's this architecture of reassurance this this uh feeling about being in the disney parks where it hugs you that's to me really why people go to the Disney parks again and again and again. It's, it's not about the IPs. Those are things that are attractions and they may like a particular character or, or something that's like that, but it's more the whole general attitude. That's why when, um, 
um, when Disney does something that's not quite fitting with it, when they did the the ride where um, they uh, the 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 Stitch ride where Stitch not the ride but Stitch, you know, and he, he was in the theater in the round and he was terrorizing people. It didn't go over very well because it's not what you expect from Disney. You're not expecting to be terrorized, being clamped down to a thing and having something spitting and farting at you and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Now, Universal, you would expect that, and Universal, you just sort of laugh with it, but at Disney, that didn't really work. Um, my feeling that I've been hearing from the, the Star Wars stuff is it's almost a dystopian society when you walk in there, and because of that, that's not really Universal, that's really not Disney either, you know, it should be the, the happy, bright parts of Star Wars canon, as opposed to the dark part because it probably doesn't feel right because of that so i uh, yeah i i and, and that's one of the reasons why i think that universal kind of has an edge right now because they have been able to figure out with especially recently they've been able to figure out how to um They've been able to figure out how to kind of appeal to both sides i mean there's a lot of teenagers that just do not want to go to disney you know until they grow up and then they really want to go back again um, Universal has overcome that. Universal's biggest problem, especially in the United States, is they don't do kids stuff very well. If you're under 10, you're going, <laughs> there's, there's not much to do. Now, I, I went to Universal Studios Japan and worked with their creative team for a while. And, and the stuff that they do in Japan for the children's stuff, their, their Peanuts Land, the Hello Kitty boutique is just amazing. Um, uh, the Muppet Babies area and stuff like that. They, in Japan, they actually have gotten the child stuff done pretty well. So um, I, I was really quite impressed with that. It's not something I expected Universal to do very well. You'd think as an urban planner um, with Universal, that one of their kind of uh, best things, but also worst things is the fact that they're always able to put in uh, new products, you know, Transformers and Spider-Man that are really engaging. But after a while, you know, if it gets too old, they have to supplement it with something else. And mm -hmm. because of our times where people sometimes, you know, will get over things very quickly, maybe like Avatar or other um, IP, do you think that would be ever a problem with Universal as you know, having too much time between, you know, new IPs or. Well, in Universal's case, that was by design. You see, up until up until really Disney buying Indiana Jones or the, the Lucasfilms contracts, Lucasfilm, uh, nobody paid for IPs. They got them for free. <laughs> they had to pay like the actors, you know, the, the face actors and stuff as part of the deal and stuff like that. But the producers wanted the, uh, they wanted to be in theme parks. They wanted the extra visibility and stuff like that. Disney's the one that started this idea of we're going to pay you for the IPs. And then that became this, this accelerating um, battle between the, the, especially those two companies. But, you know, look at DC and Warner's is with Six Flags, right? Um, uh, where was that all going with the question there? Bring me back on that one. I went oh, I'm sorry. Two. So my my whole uh, thing is, you know, as a planner, oh, you know, nostalgia, you... nostalgia. Universal by design has no nostalgia. Universal is it's whatever is the product that we think is the hot product at the moment is what we're going to do. Now they are starting to have a little nostalgia, like ET will never go away in Florida. ET will always be in Florida. That has probably as much to do with the fact that Steven Spielberg makes money off of every ticket that's bought for Universal Studios Florida and Universal Studios Japan. So in Hollywood, though, it became, you know, 25th anniversary. Let's shine it up and then it's gone. And it became the mummy. Um, it's going to be difficult, like if Universal wanted to trade out the Harry Potter area. But if you really think about it, Universal was always designed so that it's it's the facade. It's it's the facades, the unity, and then what goes on behind the facade can change. That's why you could have King Kong one day and then it becomes the mummy the next day. But the facade didn't change. It's like Hollywood. The show changed. So it's that's another, I think, advantage that Universal has. It's a lot easier for them to get rid of stuff. Disney, people, they grab onto it. And, you know, five people are watching Mr. Lincoln, but they can't get rid of Mr. Lincoln because those five people, you know, lay themselves out onto the street and go oh. so it's 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 um, it's unfortunately i think it's a it's a problem that disney has it's not a problem that universal has but i think it'll become a problem that universal is going to start to have thank you anybody else have any other any other questions do you think that like i know you said it's hard to predict the future but 
Do you think that Universal is now done with simulator rides since there's been so much backlash from it, especially after Fast and Furious? Yeah, I think that um, I think that they it was good that they got rid of the glasses on the Harry Potter ride. You know, and if you go to the Hollywood tour and you're on the back lot, you have to carry around 3D glasses, which is kind of stupid. Um, I think that Universal recognizes, I mean, that's another Universal thing. They're the first people to do motion simulators with screens, that kind of thing. Um, and, and they kind of became part of a crutch because in a way it was it was easy. I mean, if you really think about all the, the, the movie rides, they've all been traded out, right? Back to the Future became The Simpsons. We're on to the third version with uh, what was the Rugrats, Nickelodeon. No, it was Nickelodeon. Bill, help me out. You know this. It was Nickelodeon, right? And then became. So uh, we, Nickelodeon was our. What Minions is now. I'm sorry? It was the Minions. Oh, it, minions. Ac it actually started as the fantastic world of Hanna-Barbera. That's it. Hanna and, uh, and then it switched to Jimmy Neutron's Nicktoon Blast. Right. And then that closed. And then they actually did work on the actual facade and added uh, the additional pre-show. They redid the post-show and everything. It was a bigger redo uh, that time than it was between Hanna-Barbera and Neutron. That was just a little sprucing up, changing the film. Um, but then they spent a lot more money because, well, they owned the IP. You know, Despicable yeah. Me. It's, it's the first time that Universal's really had really good animation. Uh, yeah that's been successful so they were willing to spend money on it and everybody seems to like that but they got rid of the 3d element now there's not, yeah. not 3d anymore oh okay yeah. so that's that's one of the things and that's by design universal was always the case of it's you know if the show gets old it's time just to put in a new show it's, it's a lot easier than rebuilding it the disney thing was always based on the premise that walt disney came which is i've got a good solid show i'll just keep plussing and i'll keep adding i'll keep improving it i'll keep enhancing it again and again and that's what's going to keep bringing the guests back universal doesn't have that kind of patience universal it's like nobody's going on it it's out of here unless unless they don't have anything to replace it with and then, then it sort of lingers for a little bit longer. <laughs> but, well, you know, that stunt show that's next to Potter that nothing is there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's a lot of good real estate. Yeah. This is yeah, anything else before I put you all to sleep. Oh, there's one more question that somebody uh, posted uh, was uh, what makes Disneyland feel so cozy? And where can you really see that? Where is it apparent, Universal's parks? Um, it, Universal, I would say that it would be, um, uh, well, first of all, it's the, the metrics of the street, the size, the width of the streets, the side of the sidewalks, the use of force perspective is much more intimate. Everything's a lot lower scale. I mean, the castle's less than a half the size, you know, 77 feet in California and 198 feet. Not, that's not that tall. I, boy, see, it's, I, it's been a while since I've been doing the theme park thing. So um, whatever it is, the, everything at Disney is much smaller, much more compact. That's why it also feels really crowded at times as well, too, um, depending on what's going on. Um, and that's what makes it cozy. At Universal, I would say it would be the, uh, uh, the Central Park area at Universal Studios, Hollywood, uh, Florida. Uh, I would say if you got into the back alleys of the New York street set areas, and those back alley areas, they have that kind of intimacy. Um, I would say at Islands Adventure, it would be go below the main walkway into the lagoon area. So, you know, go out towards the water underneath the Hulk, go out um, in the lagoon and go back where the, where the, uh, bilge bar wrap thing is you can walk down there you used to be able to walk down in front of the jurassic park thing but i guess that's where the roller coaster is going right Go yeah. from the roller coasters water, in front. water there yeah and and where there's that park was designed and my favorite one is the the area where seuss landing is and you go down towards the water um that whole area that has that kind of intimacy and little quality variety and surprise elements little show elements that you can spend some time and linger over and stuff like that so uh, those would be the places that come to mind off the top of my head thanks any other questions guys you all doing good you like this uh, remote class thing, or is it more fun to be in a classroom with each other? It's kind of nice. Yeah, I like this. I feel like we're all a little bit more relaxed because when you're in class, you're like sitting yeah. kind of. Yeah. But I feel like on this, like, and Professor Z has been doing like 
his goofy Muppets and stuff. <laughs> so it's a little more fun. <laughs> I have to try yeah. to keep it interesting. I'm um, afraid the, too. The disappointing thing about moving everything online is that uh, we were working kind of as um, everybody had a partner or uh, two partners uh, and uh, they were working on designing a dark ride. And that's difficult to do, you know, when you're farther away. So we, yeah. we took away those pieces and now they're kind of being done individually. Some of them are just based on examples and submitting assignments. So it, you don't get the full experience of actually building something as much. Uh, Although you're learning how to design the way the current design ethic is, which is everybody has to cooperate this sort of way. Yeah, so. well, we, the, the project was started before COVID-19. So I guess uh, now... Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you design a queue the same way, to be honest, at this point. Um, we just did a queue design assignment uh, this week. And, uh, you know, now we, how does that apply with being six feet away? You know, so that's uh, it's a weird, uh, weird world. Hopefully we don't have to stick in this, stay in this world too much longer. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping by uh, early July we'll be more back to normal-ish, but, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I, I don't... I what the i don't know what the solution is it's it's very strange driving around the united states right now because almost every small town i've been visiting it feels like a movie set uh it doesn't it doesn't even feel vacant it feels uh i was on beale street in memphis um in the morning walking up and down beale street i was the only person there except for there was a fox tv person with a camera and we started talking because she saw me pull up with the van and She's going, what are you doing here? I go, well, I just, you know, I live on the road and I just go to places I've always wanted to go to. And I've always wanted to go to Beale Street here. And she's going, she's going, you, you just don't realize how weird this is. There's nobody here. I'm going, well, it's like, you know, 10 in the morning. Would there be a lot of people here anyways? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is, she's, this is just the creepiest thing in the entire world. Um, going to Elvis Presley's birthplace and in Tupelo and just sitting on the porch because nobody else was there. Um, but I will say if you're wanting to do urban design and if you do go out and do your little walk and stuff for exercise, it's actually a good time to see what physical space looks like without people interacting within the physical space. Because a lot of designers design physical spaces without thinking about the fact that people are using them. <laughs> and you're now being able to see that. And, and that's the, I think that will be my last little lesson is remember that the, the real secret to the Disney parks, I think, and to a certain extent became a real secret. Uh, one of the things that made the Universal Park stand out above Six Flags and the Bush Gardens and all that kind of stuff is that they design spaces that respect people, that are very people oriented, that meet the needs of people that are people sized, you know, they're human sized. Um, uh, when we need to be, uh, when we need to, to startle you, we can, but we want you to feel warm and comfortable. And that's one of the reasons people want to keep going back to these places. And that's definitely the key thing when you go to Disney and the spaces respect you that's Disney at its best that's really ultimately what Walt Disney wanted to do it's why he wanted to create a city because he realized I've created an architecture that respects people maybe I can do that where they can live work and play um, and create better people because of that let the architecture inspire them so um, Bill's a great teacher he's a little crazy at the moment with this whole talk show in his, ba his basement <laughs> right now, I, I'm going to say um, a king of comedy. This is San Francisco, man. This is San Francisco. I know, but I'm, I'm just thinking king of comedy. Um, <laughs> I, I suspect on the fourth wall where we're sitting and looking at you with the camera that there's a giant poster of an audience that looks like it's cheering. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a sound effects board for that. Hold on. I can switch to that. Let's uh, see here. Uh, I love how the moon is like 15 times as big as <laughs> the other night. The moon was that big. It was like, <laughs> last week was the seventh that we had that like super moon, but yeah. And it doesn't look like San Francisco. Oh, I guess it is the trans America tower. You're missing a big skyscraper though. There's another new big one there. Did that come yeah. through? No, but, oh, but we'll, bit and say yes oh. yes that was really funny <laughs> 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 yeah, that was great no, okay, good. Good. it's just not loud enough that's okay all right i'm going to go take advantage of the fact that i'm at natural falls look it up online natural falls with its 77 foot waterfall here yeah. in beautiful oklahoma oklahoma 
land. I'd come to Florida, but Florida is not nice to us at the moment. All of your well, parks. I was going to bring Tony on and so, so you can say hi to Tony. Oh, no, because I want a pizza. <laughs> 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 he just makes me hungry by showing all yeah, the food yeah. cooking and so. stuff. <laughs> I don't oh, get that. It's so pretty. I'm jealous. Yeah. Can, can you show us what you're what, what it looks like out there right now? It's oh here. Yeah. Where are uh, you? Like, I'm just curious. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not next to the waterfall at the moment. Because oh. <laughs> I yeah, Darn. yeah, that's okay. Kind of that. But, yeah, here. Let's see if I can do this. Is there? Uh, oh. oh, we lost your video. Oh, there. We, oh. Maybe we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it looks pretty. Oh, that's that's gorgeous. There. Oh, there it is. Oh wow. I know. Oh. That's okay. Beautiful. We can see that. There's there's the campground. Wow. Yeah. yeah no, it's 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 lovely. I mean, I I uh, yeah. with my weird place, I'll be at. Oops. Well, still there you are. Hey there. Uh, my weird place. Is that am I still here? Yeah. There. Okay. There we go. Uh, my weird place. I don't know. I'll either be there uh, today. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, or tomorrow, or something like that. Uh, will be. Um, uh, there's <laughs> there's a town called Disney, Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> it's not related to the company but there's a town called disney oklahoma so either tomorrow or the next day i'll be at disney oklahoma and they really have a campsite there that's next to a lake and then from there i'll go up a little bit and then i'll cruise through oklahoma's route 66 boy that's cold um i'll, I'll go up to uh, route 66 uh, down route 66 and just try to kill some more time until texas opens up um, opens up its uh, its parks, and then in if you anybody's going to Yellowstone this summer, assuming that Yellowstone is so. open, this summer, I hope so. I hope so too. Uh, I'll be working at Yellowstone this summer, so uh, that's that's what I'm aiming for. And with that, I just want to thank Bill. Thank you very much, Professor Z, <laughs> and the rest of you for your attention and your good questions and everything. And um, and and thanks for inviting me to your class. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right, Sam, take care. We will uh, see you on the other side one day. <laughs>